The Seven Deadly Sins is a traditionally Christian idea that attempts to wrap up the physical, mental, and emotional struggles of man into seven neat categories. These seven categories, or the seven sins, are, in no particular order, sloth, gluttony, lust, envy, greed, wrath, and pride. Since the dawn of these ideals, people have been trying to work them into almost every piece of media you could possibly think of. Take for example this Spongebob theory that posits the show being comprised of seven characters that each represent one of these seven sins. Spongebob being lust, Patrick is sloth, Mr. Krabs is greed, and so on. This theory though can be applied to almost any movie, show, book, or in the case of today's video, video games. In the game Elden Ring, there are seven bosses called shard bearers. What a shard bearer is doesn't specifically matter at the moment, but you can think of these seven as sort of the main characters of this game, other than the player of course. Because there are seven sins and seven shard bearers, it's easy to see why this theory might already start to make sense. I mean, the numbers make it somewhat of a layup, but I started breaking down the sins and their classifications, and I found that each one of these seven bosses fall into their own category category without having to do much, if any, mental gymnastics. So sit back, grab some popcorn or popcorn substitute, because today I'm gonna spin you a little tale about Elden Ring and the Seven Deadly Sins. The first sin we'll talk about is Sloth. Godric the Grafted fits into this category better than any other boss in the game by a mile, starting even with his name, Godric the Grafted. What exactly does it mean to graft in Elden Ring? Well, it quite literally means to take other people's body parts and graft them onto yourself, like a skin graft in real life, granting you the strength and power of those whose parts you took. Godric, a descendant of Queen Merica herself, was born as the runt of the litter, as described by finger reader Enya. He was never strong on his own, not before the shattering, and not after. In fact, his own remembrance calls him a, quote, feeble man who sought power through the grotesque act of grafting. All this to say that Godric exhibits the sin of sloth by taking powers from others. Instead of nurturing his own combat prowess, he finds it easier to steal. You could maybe call this envy, but we haven't really even gotten into his story yet. When the shattering took place, Godric didn't stay in the royal capital to help defend it or protect his golden lineage. Godric instead stole the Mimic's veil and used it to hide amongst the women folk who were fleeing the capital. Again, showing that Godric isn't just a coward, but he is completely unwilling to use any of his own skills or abilities to better himself or his situation. After leaving the capital, Godric took up shelter in the Stormvale Castle, where he would begin his, again, grotesque act of grafting. Yeah, not a much better way to describe it than that. It's said by Kenneth Height that Godric used the castle to hide from Radon. This is yet another example of Godric avoiding his real problems and choosing to hide instead of face them. Then, the one time he actually decides to try and fight someone, he picks the one and only Melania. Yeah, you know, the woman who's never known defeat. She mops the floor with him, and as is carved into the sword monument near Stormvale, Godric the Golden, now on his knees, begging for mercy. Once again, he failed to actually do anything. Then, of course, comes our fight with him, a lowly tarnished set on rebuilding the Elden Ring for themselves. After beating him up a good bit, around half of his total health, Godric will make the insane decision to chop his own hand off. Why? So that he can graft a dragon's head onto it. Lend me thy strength. Godric is, for the last time, taking powers from someone else. If Godric had honed his own abilities, trained at all, then maybe he wouldn't have had to resort to such drastic measures. But Godric ultimately is a coward, a fraud, and is the utmost lazy boss in Elden Ring. Godric isn't the only boss to gain powers from another, though. Far from it. The boss who most exemplifies the sin of gluttony, Praetor Rykard, is no different. Rykard, sibling to great and powerful beings like Rani and Radon, is a demigod. I think some people tend to overlook his status as such, because we don't really get to see him in his pre vord state at all. That being said, he was an incredibly talented individual, being the creator of the Abductor Virgins and fathering the Magma Sorceries as we know them today. Rykard even planned to do battle with Malekith, one of the most feared and powerful beings in the Elden Ring universe. This is evidenced by the description of the Blasphemous Claw. On the night of the dire plot, Ronnie rewarded Prider Rykard with these traces. Should the coming trespass one day transpire, they would serve as a last resort foil, allowing Rykard to challenge Malekith the Black Blade, the Black Beast of Destined Death. 
If that doesn't convince you of just how incredible Rykard was, I'm not sure what will. This all to say that Rykard enjoyed his status, he enjoyed his power, and he enjoyed being in control. Maybe even too much. Rykard was a Justicier, and headed a company of Inquisitors, think the likes of Inquisitor Giza. They would travel the lands between persecuting and torturing heretics to the Golden Order. He became so obsessed with the idea of power and this position of control that he, like mentioned by the Blasphemous Claw description, joined his sister Ronnie in orchestrating the Night of the Black Knives. To keep it short, the Night of the Black Knives was what happened when Ronnie stole a fragment of Destined Death from Maliketh, imbued the Black Knife assassins with its power, and then they murdered Godwin the Golden. This event is said to be the catalyst for the Shattering. Whether Rykar knew that Merica would shatter the Elden Ring or not after this event isn't clear, but what is clear is that Rykar obtained a part of the Elden Ring for himself. With the Great Shattering War now in full swing, Rykar would launch a campaign against the Erdtree and the Greater Will, the very same Greater Will who he was a Justicier for just years before. Rykar gathered an army of recusants and joined in the Shattering War himself. Though his Great Rune, nor his newfound enemies, was enough to satisfy his hunger for power. His ambitions led him to quite literally feed himself to the blasphemous serpent that resided on Mount Gelmir, the one we know as the God Devouring Serpent. Just like Godric did, Rykard has now essentially borrowed power from another being. A quote from the Gelmir Knight's armor, it bears an emblem that none wear any longer, standing as it does for a lord that fell from lofty ambition into gluttonous depravity. Like I said, some of these really just write themselves. Of course, our character, the Tarnished, defeats the God Devouring Serpent, and Rykard is awakened once again, this time fully in control of the serpent's body. The first thing he says when he wakes up, Rykard has no intention of stopping here, of being satisfied with his power, and thus the Tarnish slays him using the Serpent Hunter. After his defeat, Tanith, Rykard's consort, begins to devour the Great Serpent's body and begin the gluttonous cycle over once again, a fitting end for Rykard and Rykard's mother, Renala. Now, at first, I thought lust was going to be the hardest sin to assign, because, I mean, nobody's trying to, like, bone you mid-fight. Well, Melania gets naked, but that's definitely not an invitation. But looking deeper into what lust actually is, it's much more complicated than any feelings of infatuation or, uh, more sensual desires. Lust simply means that you have a strong desire for something, and what Renala has a strong desire for is love. Some backstory, Renala is the matriarch the queen of the Carrion royal family. In fact, she's the reason the Carrion house is even considered royalty at all. Renala once attended the Raya Lucaria Academy, and with her lunar magic, she became its master. Then, when Merica established her new age of the Erd Tree, Radagon was sent to Liurnia with an army in tow to enforce this new age upon the area. Renala, along with the rest of the Academy, battled two entire wars against Radagon and his forces, both wars with no clear victor. To make peace, Radagon consumed the Celestial Dew, which allowed him to profess his love to Renala, and they married in the Church of Vows. The two would go on to have three children, two of which we've at least touched on, Rykard and Ronnie. The third was, of course, Radon, who we'll talk about later. Also, quick aside, Renala gifted Radagon a sword, the Golden Order Greatsword, which is cool as f ladies, take notes. Anyways, the two were happily married until Godfrey had outlived his usefulness and Merica made him leave the lands between. This left an opening for Elden Lord and Radagon swooped in, becoming the second Elden Lord. If you don't know, it is heavily, heavily implied that Radagon and Merica are the same person, so personally, I think Radagon is a man made from Merica's own ambitions, who is essentially her avatar and enacts her will for her. When Radagon abandoned Renala, he left behind an amber egg that contained the great rune of the unborn. To quote the Queen's Crescent Crown description, when Renala lost her husband, her heart went along with him, and then those at the Academy realized that Renala was no champion after all. How terribly sad is that? The Academy members would then lock away Renala in the Grand Library where she would slowly lose her sanity. She would sit clutching the amber egg left by Radagon, a shell of her former self. Renala would birth 
what are described as juvenile scholars using the egg, but they wouldn't live for long, and when they would die, she would use the egg to reincarnate them. Again, all Renala wanted was to be loved. When the Tarnished eventually arrives, Renala hardly even battles you at all, just floating in her bubble, holding her amber egg. It's only when Ronnie comes and summons an illusion of her mother in her former glory that we get to have a real fight, but we are quickly reminded that after beating this illusion, Renala has no intention to fight us. We take her great rune, and she's left alone with her amber egg, offering to grant us the gift of rebirth, and longing for her once husband, who she loved so dearly. Yeah, that was a fucking bummer, honestly. Uh, unfortunately, the sad backstories aren't getting better anytime soon, because the next boss on the chopping block is Morgoth, the sin of envy. There is a lot to talk about with Morgoth, but it's probably easiest if we start at the beginning. Morgoth, born to Merica and Godfrey, is an omen. An omen is an accursed being seen by many as an impurity. They're born with horns covering their bodies, and in some cases have tails and feathered wings. Most every omen when born has their horns removed from their body, which almost kills all of them, but omens born to royalty such as Morgoth are kept under the capital in the Landell sewers, known in the game as the subterranean shunning grounds. Morgoth hated that he was born an omen, and would eventually even seal his own blood into a blade that he later disguised as a cane. How he can seal his own blood away and not die, I don't know. In the sewers, Morgoth would grow, and presumably hone his combat abilities, because when Merica shattered the Elden Ring, Morgoth was ready. He would claim a piece of the ring, his great rune, and instead of taking his newfound freedom and power and escaping the capital of Landell, he stayed. He would plant himself at the foot of the Erd Tree, slaughtering any of those foolish enough to try and gain entrance, and take up the name Margit the Fell Omen. Morgoth, or Margit, wanted desperately to become Elden Lord and serve the Golden Order. That's why he stayed, and that's why he fought. He would even fend off a younger Radon, who tried to claim the capital with his Red Mane soldiers. Morgoth went so far as to create an illusion, an avatar of Margit, that he would station in the Stormvale Castle to prevent the Tarnished from taking Godric's Great Room, essentially protecting him so that we couldn't fully rebuild the Elden Ring and disrupt the Golden Order. Even though Godric is, in Morgoth's own words, a willful traitor. Of course, the Tarnished does get Godric's Grey Room, and they do challenge Morgoth, making him resort to channeling his so-called accursed powers and using his cool blood sword. Morgoth, in doing so, says these words that kind of break my heart. The thrones stained by my curse, such shame I cannot bear. Morgoth truly believes that just by being an omen and using his powers that he has disgraced the very Erd Tree that he has been protecting for so long. Before dying, Morgoth says this, None may claim the title of Elden Lord. Thy deeds shall be met with failure, just as I. Morgoth's story is a tragedy, but I haven't really explained why I think the sin of envy applies to him, and that's because I think it's become pretty clear. Morgoth envied the likes of his father, the great Godfrey, for being the first Elden Lord. The one thing he wanted, to serve the Golden Order, just wasn't possible. Morgoth deserved more than anyone else to become Elden Lord, but in the end, he would simply be stuck wishing. Another major downer, I know, but the next one is sad in a different way. You see, Morgoth wasn't an only child. Oh no, he had a twin brother. This brother would take a much less noble route than Morgoth, instead taking the path of greed. Moog was also born an omen and was also exiled to the Landell sewers. While in these sewers, Moog wouldn't make the same use of his time that Morgoth did. Moog was able to contact an outer god, an incredibly powerful being known as the Formless Mother. The Formless Mother lent him her power, setting his accursed blood ablaze, thus inventing the blood flame magic we know today. Like his brother, when the Elden Ring was shattered, he claimed a piece, making it his great rune, and then seemed to almost vanish. He would venture deep underground, and begin building his own empire, his own dynasty. Moog, being a demigod and an omen, meant that his power was somewhat limited. He would never be able to fully ascend to godhood, so he would need to find someone who could. Someone like his half-brother, Mikola. Mikola is a child born from Radagon and... Merica. Truly, I don't understand how that works at all, but Mikola and his sister Melania were both born with terrible ailments due to their parents being the same person. I'll talk about Melania's troubles later, but Mikola was cursed with always having the body of a child. Mikola is also an Empyrean like his mother, Merica, which meant he would be a suitable candidate to ascend to godhood, again, like his mother. Mikola would go on to grow the Halig Tree from his own blood, a place for exalted ones like the Albanorix and the Misbegotten. 
He would then implant himself in the Halig tree and hoped to grow it into another Erd tree. Before that process could be completed though, Moog came to the Halig tree, cut Mikola out, and kidnapped him. They would arrive back in the Moogwin palace, and Moog would wait for Melania to come out of his cocoon, hoping to help him ascend to the status of godhood and then be Mikola's consort. Hopefully you're seeing why I gave him the Greed title. When the Tarnished makes it to the top of the palace, they are faced with Moog and the still slumbering Mikola. Moog attempts to defend himself, pulling out all the stops and using the Formless Mother's most powerful techniques, but it's not enough. Moog is killed, and his hopes for the Moogwin dynasty die with him. If Moog does end up killing the player though, you'll hear this line, Mikola is mine, and mine alone. He would rip his half-brother away from his home, sacrificing Mikola's hopes and dreams to achieve his own desires. Moog is the epitome of greed, and frankly, he's pretty creepy. As I just mentioned, Mikola had a sibling named Melania. A twin, actually. While Mikola was cursed with having an eternally childlike body, Melania was cursed with having a body afflicted by the Scarlet Rot. The Rot would slowly eat away at her, costing her several limbs over the years. One day though, Melania met a blind swordsman who taught her his ways, and this would keep the Rot at bay for the time being. The blind swordsman actually had sealed away an outer god once, the God of Rot. Over time, Melania mastered the way of the blade. She became strong enough to claim that she had never known defeat. She would gain a following of loyal soldiers like her clean rot knights who were being eaten away by her rot when fighting by her side. Her brother Mikola eventually created a needle that, while not fully stopping it, would halt the progression of the Scarlet Rot's rampage on Melania's body. Things were good then, until of course the event that changes everyone's lives, the Shattering. Melania claimed a fragment of the Elden Ring for herself, and during the war that would ensue post-Shattering, Melania would lead an army south of the Halig Tree. This is when she would humiliate Godric the Grafted, and then would eventually face the great General Radon in Caelid. During the battle, Melania was overwhelmed, and had to resort to using the Scarlet Rot to her advantage. In this moment, Melania unleashed a Scarlet Bloom that would not only eat away at Radon's brain following this fight, but would consume the very land around them turning Kaelid into the freaky hellscape that it is today. After this terrible conclusion, Melania's knight Finlay would carry her all the way from the battlefield in Kaelid back to the Halig Tree. Once they returned, Mikola had been kidnapped, and Melania entered a slumber for some time. She awakened many years later to find that the Tarnished had reached the Halig Tree roots. Melania rises to her feet once again, and does battle as fiercely as she once did. She's beaten, until she unleashes a second Scarlet Bloom and gains the power of the Outer God of Rot that had been sealed by her master so long ago. Even with this power, she's defeated. Her last words are to her brother Mikola, an apology for being defeated. Oh, dearest Mikola, my brother. I'm sorry. I finally met my match. Now, I didn't even mention the Sin of Wrath, even though it's been on the screen this entire time. I wanted to give you the full story first, before showing you where Melania displayed her wrath and the wrath she was cursed to bear. Melania's first instance of wrath is when she leaves the Halig Tree to march on the greater lands between. Had Melania stayed back there, she may have been able to prevent her brother's kidnapping, or at least would have been there to help. Her second instance of wrath is in her battle against Radon. Not to be outdone, Melania would unleash literal hell on the land of Kaelid, corrupting and destroying most of the life in the area. And lastly, Melania unleashes a wrath that isn't even really her own against the Tarnished. She was born with the wrath of the rock god inside of her, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. This god would have its way with her one way or another. I truly can't imagine what other Shardbearer could possibly personify wrath better than Melania, Blade of Mikola. That leaves us with one last Shardbearer and one last sin to discuss. General Radon and the Sin of Pride. Like the others, let's start with his early life. In the description of Radon's Red Mane Helm, we get an interesting look into Radon's psyche. Radon inherited the furious, flaming red hair of his father Radagon, and is fond of its heroic implications. I was born a champion's cub, now I am the lord of the battlefield's lion. Look, there is nothing wrong with being confident and right. <laughs> Radon idolized Godfrey and would adorn his own armor with lions, the symbol of Godfrey. 
He also would grow to be f***ing huge as an adult, so big in fact that he would outgrow his trusty steed Leonard. Radon would remedy this issue by studying gravity magic in the town of Celia, under the wing of an alabaster lord. These ambitions for gravity magic grew much wider than the scope of being able to ride his horse, though. Radon would say this to the alabaster lord after he had finished his training, I thank you for your tutelage, for now I can challenge the stars. Radon was not messing around. Another description, this time from the Star Scourge heirloom, reads, The mightiest hero of the demigods confronted the falling stars alone, and thus did he crush them, his conquest sealing the very fate of the stars. This might not sound like much on the surface, but Radon was literally holding a sky full of falling stars in place, arresting their cycles, earning him the moniker of Star Scourge. Needless to say, Radon wasn't just the Lord of the Battlefield's Lion anymore, but he was now the Lord of the Battlefield himself. That was until the shadowing took place, the war began, and he eventually had his duel with Melania. Radon would not make it out of this battle the same man. The Scarlet Rot would slowly eat away at his brain until he was a senseless monster, consuming dead men on the battlefield where he was injured on that fateful day. Though if it makes you feel any better, he never turned on Leonard, and he was still using his magic to stop himself from crushing him. Then one day the Tarnished came, and so commenced the Festival of Radon. That's right, a festival held for the sole purpose of giving Radon an honorable death. The Tarnished would defeat Radon, and get a true scope of just how much Radon was handling at the time. All of the stars you see here were being held in place by Radon with his gravity magic, while you were fighting him. Could you imagine the sheer power it must take to do something like that? That all being said, I think it's clear that Radon was a prideful man, but rightfully so. I mean, he earned it. But does it count as a sin then? Yeah, definitely. Radon's pride for holding the stars back definitely put him on the disadvantage for any future battles because much of his energy was being used somewhere else. Had he conceded to the stars and used his full potential against Melania, it's very likely that he would have crushed her in battle. Though to be fair, it's not certain. Either way, it's possible that Radon could have avoided his cruel fate and prevented the land he called home from being turned into Fallout 5. His men would carry this same mantle of pride when they would decide not to flee from the land and to succumb to its effects just as their great general did. All in all, I'd say every one of the seven shard bearers is flawed, some more than others, but still applicable to all. And though I think each sin does fit well with each boss, I do think that some other bosses may have exemplified some of the sins better than others. For example, I think Gideon is a great example of both greed and envy, and I think that Godfrey is the personification of wrath. But I really wanted to keep it to the shard bearers, and not just mix in a bunch of other people. Also, I know Ronnie and Mikola are also technically shard bearers, but we can't do battle with them, and we don't get remembrances from them, so they count less, I guess. I really wanted this video to just be like a fun thing for me to put out while I'm working on some bigger projects. This isn't typically my style of video, but let me know if you liked it. Doing research for it only made me appreciate the depth of Elden Ring's story even more. It's almost like they had the seven deadly sins in the back of their mind. I hope you guys enjoyed. Leave a like if you did, it makes the algorithm like me more, and subscribe if you want to see more in the future. Thanks for watching, GG's everyone.